to Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. Somebody says, what in the world is Ecclesiastes? Well, you find the Psalms, which is about right in the middle of your Bible, and then turn to the right and you'll find Proverbs, and then right after that you'll find uh, the little book of Ecclesiastes. The little book of Ecclesiastes. And so... Tonight, good service this morning, and uh, good to see uh, some visiting folks. The Kohler family was here this morning, and what a blessing that was, and so I hope you got to meet them. And also, Br Brandy was here this morning, got to meet her, and what a blessing just to meet some new faces. And so, Ecclesiastes chapter number one, have you found your place there? Let's read the first, uh, let's read the first two verses. The Bible says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Boy, when God says something once, it's important. When he repeats himself five times, it's very important. And so, the word there five times, vanity. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we can drink from the springs of living water anytime that we want to. And thank you for the washing of the water by the word. I pray that you'd bless your word as it goes forth tonight. I pray that you give us free course in our hearts. And uh, Lord, help us to prioritize our lives, not like Solomon did, but like we should. And uh, Lord, Solomon had to learn some hard lessons in, in life. And uh, he was a, a, an ultimate success as a king, but he was an ultimate failure as a father. And I pray that you'd help us not to be distracted with the same things he got distracted with. And Lord, uh, give us wisdom, I pray, as husbands, as dads, grandmas, and grandpas, Lord, all of us. I pray that you'd give us wisdom on how to order our day because life is soon coming to a close. And we thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for giving us these basic instructions that we need every day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you would know what, I would, what I'm talking about when I would say uh, this was an epic failure? You know what I'm talking about? An epic failure is something that looks like it's going to start off to be a good idea. And uh, maybe you've seen a video before, and, I, and I've seen some videos. My kids have hoverboards, those electric hoverboards that light up. And from time to time, I'll, I'll see a video of somebody that really, maybe it's age, maybe it's their geometry, I'm not sure. But they're about to get on the hoverboard. It's Christmas morning. The Christmas tree's in the background. And a hoverboard, it's something you balance on. It's got two wheels, one on each side, no training wheels. And you stand on it, and you balance. And if you lean forward, it goes forward. And if you lean backward, it goes backward. You can turn left to the right. How many of you have seen those before? Well, it's an epic failure when you see somebody that shouldn't be getting on one. By the way, I've never, been, I've never been on one. I'm not taking that kind of chance. And then they get on one, and it looks like it'd be a good idea, and it looks like fun, but all of a sudden they go crash into the Christmas tree or crash into the china cabinet or spinning around, and, and it's really fun to watch. It looks like it's a good idea, but really, really it's a bad idea. It's an epic failure. Now Solomon is an interesting person to study in the Scripture. We know that he was the third king in Israel after David his father. And, uh, and Solomon did some things right. And he was really commended for some things. But really, Solomon is what I would call the world's biggest fool. You know why? Because he started out right, but he wasted a lot of his life. And uh, when you get to the book of Ecclesiastes, that's what this book is about. It's about Solomon's really pursuit of of what he thought was important to him, and then he gets what he's, he's pursuing, and then he says this, it's vanity, uh, of vanities, all is vanity, saith the preacher. And so, it's interesting, Solomon was an epic failure when it came to being a father. He succeeded as a king, but he failed as a dad. And I want us to notice five pursuits that, that caused Solomon to really fail as a father and understand this and I'm sure you do that there's balance to everything and uh, and balance is not necessarily like a seesaw you know you have your fulcrum in the middle and it goes this way and that way I think balance in the Christian life is more like spinning plates 
Uh, there's a difference. It takes a little bit of skill. And you, so you get this one spinning and you get this one spinning and then you have to make your adjustments all the time. And that's kind of the way the Christian life is. But Solomon pursued five specific areas and when he got to the end of his life, you know what he said? It was an epic failure. And so I want us to notice a couple of them right here from the text. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and uh, we come down to verse number 12. Uh, he says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Notice he says in verse 13, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by what? Wisdom. Now, what was Solomon known for? He was known for his wisdom. I mean, he asked God, one of his initial prayer requests, at least that we have recorded in the scripture, was that the Lord would give him what? Wisdom. That is a prayer that God desires to answer. And so Solomon pursued uh, wisdom. He says uh, in verse number 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. It's interesting. David talked to himself. The prodigal, we looked at this morning, what he do? He talked to himself. Solomon... He talked to himself, hey, it's okay. It's okay to talk to yourself. And so he communed with his own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, and my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of the Spirit. And so really, the first area that Solomon pursued, that necessarily wasn't a bad thing, but it distracted him uh, to being a success as a father, is he pursued wisdom. Now, when I think of wisdom, as he mentions it here, I'm not talking about godly wisdom. And the, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. And, uh, and, and Solomon says that he pursued not godly wisdom, but worldly wisdom. And uh, when he came to the end of it, boy, it was all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the way life really works. And, uh, and many times it's counterintuitive. There is this uh, phrase, there's this concept we talk about sometimes, common sense. You know, logical common sense. I wonder if most people in America have any clue what logical common sense really is. And it has the idea of, of thinking, but wisdom is knowing how life really works. There's consequences and there's repercussions to the decisions and, and there's cause and effect. And Solomon gave his heart to pursue wisdom and uh, he said it's all, it's all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. By the way, wisdom, what Solomon is referring to here, is not the accumulation of knowledge or facts. Uh, wisdom is how life really works. Now, there's some young person here that says, See, I don't need to go to college. And, uh, and, and that's not what I'm saying. I, what I'm saying is, wisdom is not the accumulation of knowledge. It's understanding how life really works. If God gives you an opportunity to go to college, you be a good steward of your opportunity, and you go. Uh, you study hard, and you work hard, and you get all you can, and you can all you get, because you're going to use it someday. But Solomon, who would have been the wisest man, maybe one of the wisest men that this earth has ever seen, said, you know what? It's all vanity. The pursuit of education in and of itself, and the pursuit of facts and knowledge, it's all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. And so he's just kind of being transparent here. And, uh, and wisdom really starts, you know where it starts? It starts with understanding and having a reverential awe for God Almighty. And if you don't start right there, you're not setting yourself up for victory. You're setting yourself up for failure. And so Solomon says, it's vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Look at chapter 2 uh, in verse number 1. He said, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with myrrh. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this is also vanity. And so Solomon's kind of giving himself now to the social scene. Uh, if it feels good, do it. 
And uh, he get, gave himself to pleasure. And he said, it's vanity. Verse number 2, I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. And so you could say this, Solomon, he pursued or was distracted by earthly sensual wisdom, which James warns us about. Uh, he was distracted or he pursued that and it was all vanity. Okay, then he pursues the social scene. He says, I gave my heart to know or to seek after what? Wine. Wine, that's the social scene. Hey, if it feels good, do it. By the way, if you've had any, you've had too much. Yeah. Uh, I believe the Bible teaches the position of a believer of total abstinence from alcohol. Uh, take your Bibles, please, and just turn back a couple of pages uh, to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. In verse number 29. Proverbs 23 and verse 29. Also the words of Solomon. Uh, the Bible says in verse 29, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? By the way, uh, I don't understand why people... This is the way they live, a lot of people. I mean, they live in, in this stupor all the time. Verse 30, They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. The eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. You ever got seasick before, but not on a boat? and got motion sickness, he's warning you that this is where uh, this is going to lead. Uh, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? And this is, this is the thing that amazes me. I will seek it yet, what? Again. And, uh, and it's not the, the disease of alcoholism. You know what it is? It's the sin of, of drunkenness. And Solomon warns against it. And uh, the whole show, social scene, hey, if it feels good, do it. If it makes you happy, uh, live, laugh, be happy. It looks good at the uh, Hobby Lobby. But you know what? It's a philosophy of life that really is just a touch deceptive. And uh, because for the believer, happiness always comes through obedience to God first. And so Solomon said, I pursued wisdom. He was distracted. It was vanity. He said, I pursued wine, and it was vanity. It's not vintage. You know what it is? It's vice. And so he says in verse number 4, notice he says, I made me great work. Somebody would say here, well, well, I don't really think that a sip or two of wine could be all that bad. It could be all that bad. Now, the Bible says, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And so you might think it's safe to have a little bottle of wine in your cabinet and you can take a drink every now and again. But what if your nephew or niece or grandson or granddaughter comes over and says, Oh, granddad's got it or grandpa or mom and dad, so it must, if it's okay for them, it must be okay for me. And the first person that ever takes this first drink of alcohol never plans on it ruin, ruining and shipwrecking and making their life a total disaster. You can choose to drink, but you can't choose the consequences. Right. And so, just leave it alone. And so, Solomon says, I gave my heart to know that, and it was vanity. Look at verse 4. He says, I made me great works. I built me houses and planted me vineyards. Boy, Solomon, he wasn't one of those kings that just sat at the gate of the city and had his scepter and his crown on his head and just kind of gave his nod by everybody that came into town and everybody that went out of town. Solomon was a hard-working, industrious individual. And he gave his heart to work. He said, I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards and planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. You know what he was into? He was into agriculture. 
I mean, this man knew how to operate. He knew how to make things work. Uh, he says in verse 6, I made me pools of water to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. So there was uh, an interest in agriculture and in irrigation. And the Bible says in verse 7, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. So agriculture, irrigation, li the livestock trade, antiques, arts. Look at verse 8. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and the provinces. Uh, and I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Solomon had, he had his hands in everything. He was not some guy that just was living a life of ease. He was a very industrious man and he gave himself really to, to the pursuit of hard work. Now, I'm, I'm all hard for hard work. You probably are too. But again, there's a balance. And I, I think a person ought to work. Paul says if a man doesn't work, a man shouldn't what? Eat. And so I encourage young people that have an opportunity to work, even if they're not getting paid for it, go work. Go learn something. Go get busy doing something. Get your mind engaged and your hands engaged. But again, it's a balance. And you know where a lot of Americans are? They're working 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And you know what? A life of work without worship is a wasted life. You'll work your whole, whole life away. And, and, and you know what? Your children, hey, they love for you to work. And they love for the, the food to be put on the table. And I'm sure your wife appreciates that very much. But you know how your children and my children spell love? T-I-M-E, time. You can make money back, but you'll never get your time back. And again, Solomon, he succeeded as a king, but he failed as a father. He was distracted by the pursuit of wisdom by the pursuit of wine, by the pursuit of work. Look at verse number 8. He says, I gathered me also silver and gold. Look at verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever my eye, mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. So you could say that Solomon was distracted by wealth. Now, here, here's a trivia question. Here's a couple of trivia questions just to see if you're engaged. Uh, the first shall be what? Last. Uh, if you're going to live the Christian life, you must what? Die. Uh, who came first? Adam or Christ? Good answer. Christ, I heard that. Somebody would say Adam. But, uh, but does the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? That's not what the Bible says. It says... That the love, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And you can find successful businessmen, you can find successful doctors, you can find successful presidents, you can find successful construction workers, you can find even, Pastor Henry, successful preachers, and they succeeded in the area where they work, but they failed in their home, and that's not right because that's a wrong priority. And, uh, and Solomon said, I gave my heart to know wealth. He says, man, what, whatsoever mine eyes desired. Man, if he wanted a 2021 F-350 King Ranch four-door Power Stroke Turbo Diesel. Is somebody with me? Maybe I'm a Chevrolet crowd. I don't know. But you know what? If that's what he wanted, you know what he did? He went down to the Ford dealership and that's what he got. You know, if he wanted a four-wheel drive chariot, that's what he got, you know. A one horsepower or two horsepower chariot. That's what he got. Uh, whatever he wanted. He didn't hold back. He pursued everything. And you know what he says? It's vanity and vexation of the spirit. Fast forward to Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. He gives some great insight on this idea of wealth and riches. Uh, he says in uh, verse number 10, notice Solomon, he's speaking from experience. He that loveth silver shall what? Not be satisfied with silver. So as money, if, if that's all you live for, if that's all you work for, it's not a tool to you, it's an idol to you. Solomon says, if that's what you love, it's not 
going to satisfy. And you're always going to be in this state of mind. If I can just get a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and it's never going to be enough. And the fact of the matter is, the question is not how much I make, but rather I need to ask myself, how much do I spend? Maybe I can trim that back a little bit. And Solomon says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also what? Vanity. It's an ethic failure. He says in verse number 11, When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is it there to the beholding of the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You know why a rich man doesn't sleep well? Because he laid in bed all night worried about how he can hold on to what he's got. He's got people coming from this side trying to work him over. He's got people from this tri side trying to come over and get something what he's got. So he lays in bed all night trying to hold on to something that's eventually going to go and spread wings and fly away uh, someday. And Solomon learned this the hard way. And you know what? He was successful as a king. He was successful as a businessman. He was successful as a farmer. He was successful as an architect. But can I tell you, you study the life of Rehoboam, his son, and he failed as a father. He failed. And it's interesting, he asked the Lord wisdom for everything except for wisdom on how to be a godly father. And you know what? He led his children astray. And so he pursued or was distracted by wisdom. He pursued and was distracted by wine. He was distracted by work. He, was per, per, he pursued and was distracted by wealth. Take your Bibles and fast forward to chapter number 7. Somebody said, man, is the preacher going to preach through the whole, all 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes? Kind of, kind of. But we'll be done on time. There's ice cream awaiting in the balances. Don't mean to distract it, just keeping you engaged. There's good things to look forward to, okay? You girls like ice cream? What's your favorite? Oh, vanilla. You got to be fast with that. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. This is the fifth, fifth area that Solomon was distracted by. Uh, you come down to verse number 25, and the Bible says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. He says in verse 26, And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is as snares and nets and her hands as bands. And so Solomon pursued women, guess what? And he got all that he wanted and he found out it was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Solomon really was the world's biggest fool. I mean, he had everything. God gave him, for lack of better words, God gave him the keys to the kingdom and began to bless him in amazing ways, but he was the world's biggest fool because it looked like he had everything in the right direction and maybe he got one foot on that hoverboard and got the next foot on it too and, and got ready to, to get himself settled and boom, it went right out from under him. And he, gave, he said, I, I, I gave my heart really to know the woman. Now he's not talking about a godly, wholesome, modest woman. Uh, in Proverbs chapter number 5, 6, and 7, we won't go there, but if you study Proverbs chapter 5, 6, and 7, primarily Solomon is warning young men about the strange woman. Somebody says, I knew that women were a little bit different. But when the Bible uses the word strange, it's not talking about unusual or weird. Men, that's us, okay? Our wives are perfectly normal. But when the Bible refers to a strange woman, it means that she's strange to the things of the God of the Bible. She's, she's cut from a different cloth. Maybe she worships idols. Uh, and she, she has no pursuit. There's no, there's no godly intention in her life. Solomon says it'll train wreck your life. He spent three chapters giving clear warnings to stay away from the strange, evil, and seductive woman. You say, well, what if I'm here and I'm a woman? How does that apply to me? Let me, let me help you. Wrong relationships. Uh, young ladies, it doesn't matter how well he looks. 
It doesn't matter if he can wrestle a bear. It doesn't matter how well he can shoot. If his feet aren't pointed in the right direction, a godly direction, you better drop him like a bad habit and wait for the will of God for you. Young men, you need to wait for the will of God for you. The right thing at the right time because somebody once said it's better to, ha to, to, to need something or, or want something that you don't have than to have something that you don't want. And that applies to a lot of things. And, uh, and Solomon gave his heart really to the wrong relationship. And you know what he says? It's vanity and vexation of the spirit. It's like putting your own selves in handcuffs and throwing away the keys. You want to talk about an epic failure. I mean, somebody that started out so good and, uh, and he wasted his life, so many years of life, uh, pursuing the wrong things. Now take your Bibles and turn, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Well, you see, that just kind of shot down the American dream. You know, education, hard work, make a lot of money, you know, eat, drink, and be married, be married for tomorrow. We die. That's the American philosophy of life. And basically, the, the American philosophy of life says you can be happy and be successful and do what you want to do without God. And can I tell you, it's a lie. Solomon says it's all a lie. It's vanity and vexation of the Spirit. And if you say, Brother Thomas, you just shot down my American dream, well, can I give you some encouragement from chapter number 12 and verse 1? The Bible says, remember, what's the next word? Now. Don't wait till you graduate from high school. Don't wait till you get out of college. Don't wait till you get married. Don't wait till you have kids. Don't wait till you retire. Remember, right now, you're what? Creator. In the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Some people say Solomon's referring to the breakdown of the human anatomy. Uh, you young people, you, you, you don't understand this really, but the day you were born was the day you began to die. <laughs> And though the outward man perishes, it's falling apart. The keepers of the house, you know what those are? Your bones. And uh, have you ever seen a person that, that trembles? And uh, boy, the keepers in the house start to shake. One day that's coming. Don't waste your life. Uh, you better remember right now before you get too old and get too much baggage in your life. The Bible says that the strong men shall bow themselves. And so the anatomy changes just a little bit. By the way, if evolution was true, those things really wouldn't happen. Uh, well, we'd be getting better and better and better and better. But what happens? You begin to get old and your body breaks down and the things you can't do uh, that you used to could do, you used to could lay tile all day, Brother Steve, without even worrying about it. But now you do it, man, you can't hardly get up off the floor and your knees hurt and by second or third day of the week, man, it's hard. And you know what? You get up and then you just kind of walk like this. Man, what is happening to me? You're dying. That's what's happening to you. And, uh, and, and Solomon says, hey, remember your Creator when... Right now, uh, before the aging process begins to take uh, full effect, when the Bible says, uh, when the, uh, the grinders cease because they are few. What's the grinders? That's your, feet, your teeth. You know what my dentist told me? If you don't take care of them, you know what's going to happen. You'll lose them. And uh, every time my, my children have a tooth that falls out and they have their juvenile teeth, I say, see, you ate too much candy there, you know, and try to stave them off of that. But, but that happens, the Bible says, and those that look out from the windows be dark, and that's the eyes become solemn and dark and begin to lose their light of life. The door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and, uh, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. So, so really you get to the point where you go to bed really, really early, like at 7 o'clock. And, uh, and then you wake up, the first whistle of the bird in the morning. You're out of bed, man, at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and so the Bible says, and, and uh, he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Too loud! Turn it down! It's too loud. Turn it down, please. It's too loud. And so the, the, the continue through the process, verse five, and when they shall uh, and and when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. You know, when I was a little younger, I was not afraid of anything. But the older you get, you become wiser. It's supposed to be that way, and uh, and you you can understand a little bit the consequences of one bad decision. 
And I find myself telling my children, hey, don't go up too high in that tree. You know, uh, don't go up on the roof of the trailer. Uh, don't go up here, you're going to fall, you know. And, uh, and 20 years ago, who, who would have cared, you know. But, but there's this uh, fear that begins to seep in. The Bible says, uh, and the, and the uh, almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets, or, the, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about the heart. You know, one day when the heart gives up, you're gone. And it's a strong muscle, and it does a great job, but one day the heart's going to stop beating. Verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Can I ask you a question? What are you being distracted by? America says this is important. Boy, having a nice car is really, really important. And uh, having a nice house is really, really important. And if, if God's given you the stewardship of that, by the way, life is not something you build, it's something that you steward. It comes in your hand, you use it wisely, and it goes out the other hand. And so, and so America says the nice car is important and the nice house is important and retirement is important and all those things are good if you pursue them and God will grant most of those things to people that work hard but they're by far the most important. Do you know what's important? What we talked about this morning, our relationship with God. My relationship with my wife. My relationship with my children. And then, then my work or my ministry. You, you say, well, how do, I, how do I get this thing straight? Notice as we finish up, verse 13, Solomon, he, he spends really 12 chapters telling us all the things that he pursued. And uh, when, he finally, when he finally got there, when he finally got what he was pursuing, he said it's all vanity and vexation of the Spirit. And then he wraps it up really for us in one or two verses. And I'm glad he does that because my mind is simple. But he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about then? Basically what he's saying. He says this, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the what? Whole duty of man. Hey, I'm not going to stand before the president of BB&T one day and give an account. I'm not going to stand before Henry Ford one day and give an account. Uh, I'm not going to stand before some coach or some teacher someday and give an account of my stewardship, but you better mark it down. I, had to, I have a 100% chance of standing before Almighty God and giving an account. And you know what Solomon says? Hey, fear God and keep His commandments. Have a reverential awe and respect for the Creator God and then obey Him. Uh, we sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but, but we can't even get folks out to church. And uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commandments. If you'll love me, you'll obey me. You'll just do what I'm asking you to do. And Solomon says, this is it. If I could put it in a nutshell, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So my question to you tonight as we close, what are you being distracted by? And again, there's balance. But are you pursuing worldly, sensual wisdom, the accumulation of knowledge? Solomon says it's vanity, vexation of the Spirit. Are, are you pursuing the social scene? Boy, I just want to have fun. And Solomon says, I pursued wine. It was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Solomon said, boy, I was distracted by work. I was a workaholic. I was involved in all kinds of stuff. It was vanity and vexation of the Spirit. A life of work without worship is a pursuit of wealth. He had everything that his eyes desired. He loved many strange women, and they turned his heart from following after the Lord. And he comes to the conclusion, you know what I should have been doing all these years? Just serving the Lord. Fearing God and keep His commandments. And men, men specifically, 
if we'll just mark it down and make it a point and have some resolve, no matter what's going to happen, no matter what pressures of life come, and they do come, that we're just going to fear God and obey. We're just going to obey and do what we know that we should do. And you know what? When we do that, God will take care of the rest. Would you bow with me in prayer, please, tonight? In just a moment, I will pray, and uh, we'll have just a, a stanza or two of an invitation song. But can I ask you this evening, you're here this evening, you, you'd say, God spoke to my heart, I've been distracted. I've been distracted. And, uh, and God spoke to my heart, and by His grace and with His help, I'm going to do exactly what Solomon said. I'm going to try to fear Him and just obey. Very simple. I'm going to fear and obey God. You say, God spoke to my heart about that, and with His help, that is what I am going to resolve to do. Fear God and keep His commandments. Can I pray with you? Just slip your hand up in the air and say, God spoke to my heart. Praise the Lord. God spoke to my heart. You say, well, I need this, and I need that, and I need this. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things that we're worried about, He'll take care of. Seek God first. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your love and mercy. We thank You that we have a Bible that not really tells us all the good things about the people that are in the Bible, but really reveals to us the human side and the negative aspects. And Solomon is somebody that's, that history lifts up as a great king and a mighty man of riches and wealth. And uh, he was a success as a king, but he was a failure as a father. And, and I pray, oh God, that You'd help me. I pray that You'd help these men these husbands, dads, grandmas, grandpas, all, all of us, help us all just to set the example for the next generation by simply pursuing the right things, really pursuing you. And, uh, and I pray that you'd be with those that raise their hands. I pray that, Lord, you give them courage and wisdom and, uh, and just help them to prioritize and seek those things which are, which are eternal. And uh, we thank you for being so good to us and thank you for your mercy and grace. And uh, we thank you that Solomon got it right really finally at the end of his life. And I pray that we wouldn't wait that long. We'd get it settled right now and have that resolve. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Stand with me and we'll have just a couple of words of an invitation song. I asked my wife, she's going to play, I have decided to follow Jesus. And so we can sing. And uh, if, the, if the Lord's dealt with your heart, you can just get some things settled right there in your seat or you can come to the altar as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. Somebody once said that one big decision can help cover a bunch of small decisions. And so, let's sing on one more verse. The cross before me, the world behind me. 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 No turning back, no turning back. Pastor Henry's going to come and close us, but thank you all so much. Uh, good to see everybody here again, and we'll be around until the end of the week. And so look forward to seeing you all, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Pastor, thanks for letting me come and fill the pulpit and just share the burden of my heart today. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. You guys can uh, be seated there. Really enjoyed the messages and it really blessed my heart. And particularly that, that, that saying you said there, work without worship is a waste. And uh, you know, my wife's often told me sometimes, uh, you work too much sometimes. I said, well, you know, I, honey, you just, uh, it's, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not working too much. But you know, your wife sometimes has more wisdom than you do at times. So, uh, you know, each and every one of us have something that we're working on, right? Amen. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're just like, well, you know, I, I've got to work and you just don't understand. No, you really don't understand. God knows what He's talking about. Amen. And uh, so we got to be careful about that. And, and uh, you know, we're always here to help you any way that we can.
Uh, some of you have mentioned to me this morning uh, that uh, you wouldn't prepare for the offering uh, for Brother Thomas Engel. So uh, if you're able to, and if we want to call the men forward, we want to take the love offering. Uh, for those of you who may not have been able to do it this morning, Brother Shiddy, would you bless the ice cream? 